Well, welcome to a coping hour. Come on in and find a seat. I'll, uh, I'll pray for us and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to gather again with your people. On a Sunday morning, first day of the week, reminiscing again about an empty tomb and the conquering of death and the finished work of salvation. God, we thank you that you have done all that is required for we were helpless and hopeless apart from your grace, dead in transgressions and sins, unable, unwilling to turn to you that we might have life. And yet you reached into our hopeless state. You reached into our death and brought life where there was none. For these things, we give you praise. We sing and we say that from you and through you and to you are indeed all things. Lord, may the echoes of our praise for your salvation work in us reverberate into the world around us. And may we not be stodgy nor stingy with the truths that you have deposited in us. May we not be content simply to possess your grace, but may we be ambassadors of it. And may we do so humbly as those who have uh, just been so immensely privileged to have known you, to have found your love, for truly it is by you that we are in you. And so we ask that you would cause us to be humble ambassadors for the grace that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, we are in our fifth installment this morning of the Doctrines of Grace. And this morning, we're looking at the perseverance of the saints. If you've been keeping up with the outline, uh, with the acronym TULIP, we've looked at total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and now perseverance of the saints. And we have seen that all of these things are truly of one piece. We could summarize five points and the acronym TULIP into three simple words, and that is God saves sinners. Through and through, this is God's work of salvation. And the ones whom he saves are sinners. Again, if we get total depravity right, if we understand God's assessment of the human condition, then we must come and only come to God's solution for the human condition. That God would actually save sinners who could do nothing of their own accord to grasp salvation if it were given to them. No, we discovered that God must do the work of making that which is dead alive. When we come to the last installment of the doctrines of grace, we are talking essentially about the seal or the stamp of God's finishing what he started. We're looking at the reality that all those whom God saves are actually saved. They're not left with some contingency as if once saved, that salvation could be lost through uh, some foible. But the ones whom God saves, he actually saves to the uttermost. And so even though our acronym uh, typically is, is given the title perseverance of the saints, perseverance is something we'll look at as the responsibility of the Christian. The Christian must persevere. But it is right to understand that true Christians will persevere because they are preserved. God does the preserving work of the elect. All those that are his are preserved by his grace. So as we sort of renamed limited atonement, particular redemption, we renamed irresistible grace, the effectual call. We might also give a different moniker to this perseverance of the saints and simply by calling it the preservation of the saints, emphasizing this is God's work to keep his own. He preserves his own. Let's look at the doctrine of perseverance or preservation of the saints. I'll quote at length from a description from Steele, Thomas, and Quinn. And, and by the way, Omri ordered a number of copies of this book. It is titled The Five Points of Calvinism. Defined, defended, and documented, second edition, updated and expanded. Nice long title. It's out there on the book table shelf for you. Uh, there are a number of copies available for purchase. It's probably the single best book on this topic. 
Steele, Thomas, and Quinn describe perseverance of the saints this way, quote, The elect are not only redeemed by Christ and renewed by the spirit, but also are kept in faith by the almighty power of God. All those who are spiritually united to Christ through regeneration are eternally secure in him. Nothing can separate them from the eternal and unchangeable love of God. They have been predestined to eternal glory and are therefore assured of heaven. The doctrine of the perseverance of the saints does not maintain that all who profess the Christian faith are certain of heaven. It is saints, those set apart by the spirit who persevere to the end. It is believers, those who are given true living faith in Christ, who are secure and safe in him. Many who profess to believe fall away, but they do not fall from grace for they were never in grace. True believers do fall into temptations. They commit grievous sins, but these sins do not cause them to lose their salvation or separate them from Christ. End quote. One of the, we'll we'll walk through some related terms for a few moments, and then we'll look at some passages together. One of the related terms to perseverance of the saints is the doctrine of eternal security, eternal security. This is the reality that salvation of God's elect is secure and unlosable. This is an objective reality. It's outside of how you feel. It's outside of your circumstances or experiences or emotions. This is the Fort Knox of God's eternal purpose for his elect. They are secure eternally. The one whom God chooses to save is actually saved all the way till the end. At conversion, the believer is, according to Ephesians 2, 6, seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And according to Philippians 3, 20, made a citizen of heaven. These things are irrevocable. They cannot be taken away. They whom God hath accepted in his beloved, says the Westminster Confession of Faith, effectually called and sanctified by his spirit can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but they shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. Logically, if election is unconditional, that is God chooses not based on anything that one would do, anything that God would even foresee that one would do. If man can do nothing to get himself saved, if the work of salvation is all of God, then there is nothing the elect can do to get themselves unsaved. The biblical doctrines of total depravity, unconditional election, and a definite atonement lead inevitably to the doctrine of eternal security. It is true to say once saved, always saved. Again, the summary statement for the five points of Calvinism is simply this, God saves sinners. And the doctrine of eternal security is simply an affirmation of that fact. Let's talk about the term preservation. Preservation is God's work in keeping his elect in the faith until the end. Turn to Jude. Jude 24 and 25. And here, this work of God in preservation is stated so gloriously. Jude writes, now to him, that is to God, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. This doxology, this outburst of praise is given to the, as a response to the securing, preserving action of God. God is the one who is able to keep us. If eternal security were left to us, we who are able to walk away and to be faithless would surely do so. If I could lose my salvation, I would have done it a hundred times over. God is the one who is able to keep us, and he does. Let's think about the word perseverance for a moment. 
This is the believer's work in keeping himself in the faith until the end. Stay in the book of Jude. And the preservation, God's work, was what we just read in verses 24 and 25. But the persevering work of the believer is found in the same book, same chapter. There's only one chapter, just a couple verses up the page. Look at verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Now, has Jude just gone schizophrenic? (laughs) Is he disagreeing with himself here? Or are these twin realities in harmony? Believer, your job is to persevere. The one who perseveres to the end shall be saved. And God's job is to preserve. He, the one who is able to keep you from stumbling. No, these twin realities go together. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3, Peter bursts out into praise at the beginning of his letter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, not fading away, reserved in heaven for you. You, verse 5, who are protected by the power of God. Do you see that? There is God's preserving work. He is protecting believers unto that inheritance unto which they were born again. But notice the second half of verse five. You are protected by the power of God through faith. Did you notice that? The the agency of God's power in keeping and preserving and protecting your eternal inheritance is faith. Your faith, believer, that is the instrument of preservation. God is the ultimate cause of your preservation, and he uses means, i.e. the means of you clinging to him, persevering in white-knuckle grip on Christ by faith as the means of God's keeping you. One theologian says it this way, all those who are truly born of the spirit and are united to Christ by faith are kept secure in him by God's power and thus will persevere in faith until they go to be with Christ at death. The faith of a believer keeps operating, not because you had something in and of yourself natural to you, intrinsic to you, some power to keep up faith, but because the faith given to you that you exercise is itself a gift of God, part of that package of God's salvation by grace through faith. All of it is a gift, not of ourselves. Let's talk about assurance of salvation for a moment. Assurance of salvation. Assurance of salvation is the believer's subjective thoughts about eternal security applied to himself. Assurance of salvation is the believer's subjective thoughts about eternal security applied to himself. You see, Christian, you can be eternally secure, but not have assurance of salvation. It is possible to have assurance of salvation, a subjective impression that you're going to heaven and not be secure at all, not be saved at all. That is a false professor. So the the realities of assurance of salvation and eternal security are not synonyms. Eternal security is an objective reality true of every born again believer. Everyone for whom Christ died is eternally secure. And it doesn't matter how you feel about it. It is an objective reality outside of you. Assurance of salvation, however, is the subjective thoughts that eternal security applies to me. One theologian says, from the divine perspective, the issue is black and white. Genuine believers are eternally secure. From the human perspective, the issue may be somewhat gray. Assurance has a subjective dimension in reference to personal human evaluation. While eternal security never changes, assurance of salvation fluctuates with a believer's spiritual vitality. 
Think about Romans 8. Romans 8 says you are sons if you are being led by the Spirit. What does, it look to be, what does it look like to be led by the Spirit? It means to be putting to death the deeds of the body. So an active participation with the Spirit of God in the life of a believer of putting sin to death grants assurance. Listen, you have no right to assurance, Christian, if you're not on short accounts with God over your sin. If you let sin take a hold, you have no right to assurance. Uh, you, you actually are in a place where you need to be asked the question, test yourself and see if you're in the faith. It is appropriate for genuine Christians to have doubts about their salvation when their conscience is burdened because they're not going to Christ with their sin. Eternal security never changes for a genuine believer, but assurance of salvation fluctuates. A believer entrenched in unrepentant sin has no right to assurance, even if he be eternally secure. Let's talk about another related doctrine, the doctrine of apostasy. Apostasy is the falling away from the faith of a professor of the faith. So someone who claims to be a Christian, believes Christian doctrine, maybe lives a life looking like a Christian, maybe has the Christian bumper stickers and the Christian music and you named your dog Calvin or whatever. There is a Christian culture that goes along, Christian lingo that goes along, Christian music that goes along many times with non-Christians, people who are Christians in name only people who outwardly profess Christ, people who even conform externally to Christian culture. There is a good peer pressure in the church. There is a cultural Christian-y peer pressure in Bible Belt societies. Maybe you grew up in one of those. I'll never forget going to high school in Southern California and a 4,000 person public high school with an open campus and gangs and every kind of vice. And the Christian club in Southern California was very specific. You only called yourself a Christian if you were one. Because it was no fun. It was no popularity contest winner to be a Christian at Redlands High School. Halfway through high school, I moved to Texas. And we had the Bible club. Bible studies on campus, the fellowship of Christian athletes. Everybody went to FCA. <laughs> and there was no distinction between Christianese culture and someone who was genuinely born again, at least externally. Uh, there was a lot of Bible belt Christianity without new birth. And it was easy to succumb to what everybody else is doing and just sort of go along because it's comfortable. And that can be very easily the case in a Bible church. Listen, you, you, you are busy about making disciples the old-fashioned way, right? We're, we're bringing forth these little bundles of depravity. We're populating next-generation ministries with lots of little rugrats. And they learn to say the right things because mom and dad say the right things. They're taught well, they, they learn a biblical vocabulary, they have biblical categories, they're being uh, adopting a biblical worldview, a way to see the world through the lens of scripture. They want to live up to the expectations of mom and dad, the expectations of NGM teachers, maybe the expectations of siblings and the friends around them. None of those things produce new birth. It is quite possible to have an army of professing Christians who are no Christians at all. And time and trials may eventually put on display a false profession. That's the doctrine of apostasy. That is someone who made a claim to Christ Maybe looked like a Christian, sounded like a Christian, smelled like a Christian, drove like a Christian. I don't know, we'll leave that one aside. I don't know that Christian reputation for driving is all that great. And then walked away. And Christian, maybe you've been troubled by this. Have you had friends who looked like Christians for a time and then went away? Has that troubled your heart? 
Has it made you think, oh, could that happen to me? I, I don't want to fall away. Well, that would be a good response, an appropriate response, a, a take heed response. The apostle John had to write to comfort Christians on this very thing. And this is not a denial of the doctrine of eternal security. In 1 John chapter 2, John explains this phenomenon of apostasy. And this is so important that you grasp, Christian, so that your heart not be troubled in the wrong ways, so that you actually have an explanation that God's salvific work is not undermined when apostasy happened. No, God's salvation didn't fail, but a false profession was exposed. Listen to John's explanation, 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. Kind of a tongue twister. But it makes sense of the phenomenon of apostasy. Oh, they went out from us. What happened? Did, did God's unbreakable chain of salvation break? Were, were, were there gaps in foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified? Can, can God's salvific plan be pulled apart by my sin? Can it be pulled apart by circumstances or hardship or trial, nakedness, peril, sword? No, I think I remember Romans 8. Nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. But what happened? These people walked away. They're not Christians anymore. Does that mean they're still Christians and they're going to heaven even though they don't like Jesus? They don't like his people. They don't read the Bible. No. John makes it very clear. They went out from us. Because they were never of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained. They went out from us to demonstrate that they never truly were born from above. Well, this really helps. This, this helps us have comfort when people walk away. But it also helps the church's reputation. And what I mean by that is this, the, the world's complaint of Christians is, oh, you're just a bunch of hypocrites. I don't want to be a part of the church. Have you heard that complaint? Of course, it, it's the hypocrite saying, I don't want to be with a group of hypocrites. The, the reality is any sinner that joins himself to Christ and to Christ people joins a bunch of sinners who happen to be forgiven, forgiven, transformed, and guaranteed eternal life. It's not hypocrisy to say, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. It's actually integrity. But the complaint from the world will stand if the church is populated by people who are not born again, who actually are hypocrites and phonies. And so the church discipline process roots out those whose false professions are exposed by a lifestyle of clinging to sin and unrepentance. And trials and hardship expose false professions. That's a help to the church. That's a help to the church's testimony and witness. Not all who profess faith are preserved to the end, but only those who have truly been born again by the Spirit of God. While some false professors are revealed in this life, others' false faith is revealed only at judgment. Hebrews 6 describes those who have tasted things related to true faith in Christ. Yet they will hear from Christ at judgment day, the terrifying words, I never knew you. Depart from me. And do you remember their protest? I'm asking you to remember something that's still in the future. Jesus said they would say, but I did this in your name. I did this in your name. I did this in your name. And I did this in your name. And Jesus says, go away, you who practice lawlessness. When Jesus says, I never knew you, of course, he's not denying his own omniscience. He knows everything about them. But to say, I never knew you means he had never entered into intimate friendship relations with such a one. They weren't on good terms with God through Christ. 
Remember that the warning passages of scripture are contained in letters written to believers. The writers of the New Testament wrote their books to people, ones who had attached themselves to the church by profession of faith. They were not so naive as to presume that all who would come into contact with their letters were regenerate individuals. However, they did not question or disparage the professed faith of their readers. The apostles addressed the church according to its profession and in this manner included tests, exhortations, and admonitions. Admonitions to depend solely upon grace and warnings against apostasy by which the readers could measure their own profession and ascertain their status. Let's think about some perseverance passages. Turn to Isaiah chapter 43. Here's God's promise to the prophet Isaiah. But now thus says Yahweh, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am Yahweh your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. Now God's promise to Israel here is a national one, a one of an elect nation. And God's promise here is predicated on his own creatorship. I made everything. I made you. You are mine. I own you. I will, pro- I will keep my promises to preserve you as an elect people. That is not a promise to save every individual Israelite, but it is a remarkable demonstration of God's commitment to keep his own promises to finish what he starts. He said he would redeem Israel as a nation and he will. Notice also in this promise that there will be fire and rivers and water. And yet they will come through those things because God is keeping them. That's a, that's a helpful reminder when we think about preservation as a doctrine. It is not a preserving out of difficulty, but a faithful preserving of God's people in and through difficulty. Listen to Isaiah 54.10. The mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness, there's that Old Testament word for grace, it will not be removed from you. My covenant of peace will not be shaken, says Yahweh, who has compassion on you. Here's this unilateral grace of God upon people. And the whole world could fall apart, but God's commitment to his own grace based on his compassion for people will not. Jeremiah 32 verse 40 says, I will make an everlasting covenant, everlasting covenant with them so that I will not turn away from them. I will do them good. I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. And notice the twin sides of perseverance and preservation. God keeps his people in such a way that they will not turn away from him. Who gets the credit for all of that? God and God alone. Look at Jesus' words in Matthew 18, verse 12. I'll give you a little moment to turn there. Listen to the commitment from the good shepherd to go after his sheep. Remember, we we looked a couple weeks ago in Isaiah 53, Jesus laying down his life for many, or in John 10, Jesus laying down his life for his sheep. He says in Matthew 18, 12, what do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99, which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. There you get the heartbeat of God for his people, the preservation activity of God in pursuing his people, the power of God in securing his people. 
Listen to the statement about the great tribulation from Mark 13, 20. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, not made them less than 24 hours, but limited their scope. It's only going to be three and a half years. If he had not done that, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. What does that mean? The sovereign God of history has a leash on exactly how long suffering will go. In this case, the worst suffering humanity will ever experience so that he will preserve his elect. God knows all contingencies. He knows what his people could withstand. And here Jesus reveals this contingency. If those days had been any longer, the elect wouldn't have made it. God is using means here, his sovereign power and control over history, his short leash on all suffering, even the worst suffering, so as to preserve his elect. Consider again, John 3.16. We looked at this the last couple of weeks. God loved the world in this manner. Again, world there, bigger and badder than Nicodemus was thinking about. God loved that big, bad world in this way that he gave his only begotten son to what end to the end that all the believing ones in him, listen to this shall not perish. Do you hear the eternal security in John three 16? They shall not perish and the contrast, but they shall have eternal life. That is, they shall possess it. They shall own it. It, it will belong to them. Again, this is one of those unbreakable chains of salvation. God does the work through and through. Listen to the testimony of John 3.36. He who believes in the Son, present tense, possesses eternal life. What is eternal life? Life that doesn't end. The one who believes possesses eternal life at the moment of belief. Eternal life is a quality of life that begins at new birth. That is totally different than the old life that goes straight through your mortality. It never ends. Even when you take your last breath on this earth and you close your eyes for the last time and you squeeze a hand for the last squeeze, you are never left, never abandoned. Eternal life has not become something that you've lost. It goes straight through your last days on earth, right into your eternal existence with Christ. And the one who believes has it. If, if it's eternal life, it doesn't end. Anyone who truly has eternal life is secure. Absolutely secure. John 5, 24. Truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me possesses eternal life. Present tense again. He does not come into judgment, but listen to this. He has passed out of death into life. The moment you believe, You pass out of death into eternal life. Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will not hunger. The one who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you've seen me and you do not believe. All that the father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I certainly will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but I raise it up on the last day. This is the will of my father. Everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. This is Jesus, God's son in the flesh, securing his people. Nobody can take them out of his hands. He will not lose a single one. John six thirty seven. all that the father gives me will come to me and I will certainly not cast them out. John six forty seven. he who believes possesses eternal life. John eight thirty one. Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Turn to John eight. This is important that we understand. This sort of puts preservation and perseverance together in a really helpful way. Put your eyes on John 8.31. A 
And this reveals a place we have to be careful with the word belief. Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if, if you continue in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And you think, wow, okay, they believed. Now, if they continue to believe, you mean they, believers can stop being believers? Watch out in the gospel of John, because the word belief is used both for new birth faith and spurious assent. Spurious assent. That means, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Uh, not genuine faith from the heart, heart circumcision born out of regeneration, but the kind of belief that, hey, it's kind of convenient, popular, easy right now. I'll cast my lot in with Christ. That sounds pretty good. There were moments in Jesus' earthly ministry where that was really attractive. John 6, you show up, follow him, get a free meal. Hey, let's make him king. Free meals all the time. That miracle was not a handout to be a perpetual welfare program, but a demonstration of Jesus' identity and his ability to offer eternal life and forgiveness of sins. People that wanted a free lunch didn't have saving faith. They had the kind of belief that is described here in John 8, 31. Remember the, the word Jews in John uh, is often a pejorative describing unbelieving Israel, often centered on the corrupt leadership of the nation. Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, here's this contingency. What do we find out about these people? Verse 33, they answered him. We're Abraham's descendants. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we'll become free? Which is a really interesting thing to take offense at. Here is Jesus, the author of life, the one who brings an end to the slavery of sin and the tyranny of death. He brings hope and life and peace and joy and everything. And he says, believe in me, continue in my word, you'll be free. And they said, wait a second, are you calling us slaves? They take offense. And isn't it interesting how people who are self-sufficient, people who trust in themselves, take offense at the gospel. They take offense at a free gift of eternal life. They take offense at freedom. And that's what these do here. Jesus answered 834. I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Verse 36, if the son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. In other words, you have to be made free by Jesus. And if you're not, you're still a slave of sin. Jesus said, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, and yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Boy, this just took a turn. This is a really bad way to start a popular movement, right? Everybody's following you. We all believe in you, Jesus. And Jesus says, you're a slave of sin. My word is not in you. <laughs> this conversation is not going well. Verse 38, I speak the things which I've seen from my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. It was offensive for Jews in Jesus' day to claim a personal father-son relationship to the God of the universe. It was biblical, but they culturally took offense at that. Jesus is claiming an intimate relationship with the father. Verse 39, they answered and said to Jesus, Abraham's our father. And, and if they were trying to trump Jesus here, they took a few infinite steps backwards, <laughs> right? My father is the creator of the universe. Yeah, our dad's Abraham. <laughs> My dad's bigger than your dad argument is not working here. They're just offended. And Jesus called their bluff. If you are Abraham's children, verse 39, do the deeds of Abraham. As it is, you're seeking to kill me a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. And so we're not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And now they say the thing that they themselves were offended by culturally that the Jewish leadership would never have said to claim a personal relationship to God, the father. Now they're trying to outmaneuver Jesus by saying it. Verse 42, if God were your father, you would love me for I proceeded forth and have come from God. I have not come of my own initiative, but he sent me. 
Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot hear my words. Your father is Satan. (laughs) Children of the devil. This is an interesting take on belief. Remember this conversation started with Jesus said to the ones who had believed in him. This is spurious assent, not regenerate faith. There's a command here to believe in Jesus and to continue in his word. Then you are truly disciples. Listen to John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one's able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Listen to John 17. I am no longer in the world. John 17, 11. They themselves are in the world and I come to you. Holy father, keep them in your name. The name which you've given me that they may be one as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition. So that the scripture would be fulfilled. Here you have Jesus power in keeping his own and Jesus prayer to the father that he would keep them as well. Turn to Romans chapter five. Paul asserts in Romans 5, 8 to 10, that God has already done the impossible, the hard thing. He will certainly do all else that is required to keep his own. God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, shall we be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, shall we be finally saved by his life? You remember Romans 8, 1? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 begins with the no condemnation clause and it ends with the no separation clause. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Notice Romans 8, 36, if your eyes are on it. Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long, considered sheep to be slaughtered. Have you ever wondered how these two verses go together? God keeps his own and we're like fresh meat for the persecutors. Wait, if God were protecting us, preserving us, if if we weren't separated from his love, then, then surely we wouldn't just be handed over as hapless victims to those who want to persecute Christians. But notice verse 37, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer in what things being handed over to death all day long. Not being above our master, but being like him and joining in his sufferings. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, things present, things to come, nor powers, height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And you notice what leads that list. Death. The last enemy, the final enemy. The one to which we will all succumb. Physical mortality. uh, If we don't live long enough for Christ to come back for his church. Not even death can separate you from God. From his love, which is in Christ Jesus Listen to 2 Corinthians 4, 14. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and will present us with you. 
Second Corinthians four seventeen. momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. In these verses, Paul is describing future realities that are guaranteed to believers in the present. That means they make it to the end. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. There, the unbreakable chain of salvation is linked to God's own doxological commitments. God will get glory for himself by purchasing a people for his own possession that he will secure unto himself as his inheritance. Again, that is Fort Knox security. You cannot be lost when God has found you. You cannot be condemned when God has saved you. There are many more passages we could look at. Again, they're in the notes. If you want a copy of the notes, just email or text me. I'll be happy to send those to you. I want to move on to a different kind of passage. And these are the don't fall away passages. These are some warning passages in scripture. Warnings against apostasy. Listen to the parable in Matthew 13. The parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom seed was sown in the rocky places. This is the man who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself. He's only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom seen was sown among the thorns. This is the man who hears the word, the worry of the world, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And then the one on whom seed was sown on good soil. This is the man who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. In the parable of the soils or the parable of the seed, the seed is the gospel. The soils are varieties of receptions of the gospel. People who heard the gospel People who accepted or received it or assented to it at some level, but only the last soil is a saved soil. The other kinds are those who have some level of assent to the gospel. They make a profession. And yet that profession is snuffed away by Satan or choked out by distractions and worries and cares of the world. Only that which endures is the genuine soil and it bears fruit. Jesus gives this warning, Matthew or Mark 13, 13. Again, this is a great tribulation scene of tribulation saints. You will be hated by all because of my name. The one who endures to the end, he will be saved. And what's true in the tribulation is true for believers and God's people of all time. The ones who endure will inherit eternal life. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1132, when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. What does that mean? God uses discipline personally in the lives of the ones he loves in order to keep them from ending up under eternal condemnation. 1 Corinthians 15, 2 says that you are saved if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Colossians 1.22 says he has reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith. First Timothy 1.18. Paul says to Timothy, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. This is a really interesting example. Paul had specific direct revelation from God about Timothy and still encouraged Timothy fight, hold on, persevere. 
First Timothy four, one, the spirit explicitly says in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Second Timothy two eleven says it's a trustworthy statement. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. And then God's own faithfulness to his own character back up that promise. Second Timothy two warns this avoid worldly and empty chatter. It leads to ungodliness. Their talk will spread like gangrene among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus men who have gone astray from the truth saying that the resurrection has already taken place and they upset the faith of some. Demas loved this present world and deserted second Timothy four ten. Hebrews two, one gives this warning. And in fact, the entire letter to Hebrews is one giant warning letter. Don't walk away from Christ. Don't fall away from Christ. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. Hebrews 3, 6, we are of Christ if we hold fast our confidence and our boast of our hope firm until the end. Hebrews 3, 12, take care brothers that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Hebrews 3, 14, we are partakers of Christ if we hold fast. Hebrews 4, 1, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may come short of it. Hebrews 4, 14, since we have a great high priest, <clears throat> Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And then Hebrews six, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, they've tasted the heavenly gift. They've been made partakers of the Holy spirit. They have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves, the son of God and put him to open shame ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is tilled receives a blessing from God. But if that ground yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless, close to being cursed and ends up being burned. I know Hebrews six is a troubling passage for some. I would just advise you look carefully at the details of Hebrews six. Notice two things. Notice the pronouns. There is significant change of pronouns between you and then those guys who tasted and fall away and assurance of better things for us. Just watch those pronouns in Hebrews six. Notice also every description in Hebrews six of those who fall away is not used anywhere else in the new Testament of genuine believers. Those are unique descriptions of professors who are about as close as you can get. They were eyewitnesses to supernatural power that can only be found in the gospel and the power of the Holy spirit. They had a front row seat to everything that Christians experience while not experiencing new birth themselves. They fall away. Don't be one of those. And the book of Hebrews goes on and on and on with these warnings. Second Peter, first John and Jude all warn of the false teachers that lead people away from the faith. Let's talk for just a moment about the purposes of these warnings in scripture. If eternal security is real, if preservation of the saints is real. If perseverance of the saints is real, if all of this holds together, if God saves sinners, if Jesus doesn't lose anybody out of his hand, then why are these warning passages in our Bibles? Have you ever wondered that? What are they doing there? Well, they serve God's good purposes. First of all, they encourage believers to take the reality of apostasy seriously. It means we take it seriously for ourselves. We take it seriously in prayer on behalf of others. There are those who will show up on judgment day and say, Lord, I did this in your name. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. That is a reality. So the warning passages are there to drive that reality home to the heart. We don't be flippant with a profession of faith. We take pains to make sure our faith is real. The second purpose of the warnings is they are God's means of grace to keep the elect. If you and I heed those warnings, we cling to Christ even tighter. We sing with Keith green. I don't want to fall away from you. 
And I, and I hope that's your heartbeat. And maybe that's your response when you've seen others walk away from Christ and you think, well, where else is there to go? You're, you're, you're going back to emptiness and nothings. And, and, and I hope it makes you cling to Christ more tightly. God actually uses those warning passages as a means of grace to keep the elect. And it is God's means of grace to false professors, encouraging them unto self-examination before it's too late. We have baptism testimonies here on Sunday mornings on baptism Sundays. How many of those entail somebody who made a profession of faith young and over time discovered that they were no real Christian trials exposed a lack of spiritual life. Some urgent need revealed the urgent need for new birth. That is God's kindness. These warning passages are used by God to help people discern a false profession. We need to think about the path to apostasy. In scripture, the pathway to apostasy is a hard or a hardening heart. This is the warning in Hebrews 2.1. We must pay closer attention so that we do not drift. In Hebrews 3, 12 and 13, take care, brethren, there is not in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away. The New Testament talks about sclerosis of the heart, a a hardening of the heart. Uh, Cardiosclerosis are the Greek words to describe that which is a, a heart that is hardened. How do you keep a soft heart before the Lord? Any known sin? Confess, forsake, turn away from short accounts with God. Come to the Lord's table with sincerity of heart as a regular act. Confess your sins to one another as believers in the body of Christ. You don't sear your conscience. Don't be casual with the burden of guilt, but run to Christ with these things. And how critical is our fellowship together. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. You may be familiar with the proof text here. You know, the, you got to go to church verses. You know, if you, if you were on a road trip for four weeks and uh, somebody called you and, and quoted Hebrews 10, do not forsake the assembly. I'm on vacation. If you were gone for six weeks, six months, People are like, hey, uh, haven't been to church in a while. What, what's up? How, how are you doing? Uh, this is Hebrews 10. Let us hold fast, verse 23, the confession of our hope without wavering. Verse 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, period, new topic. Do you see that little topic break there in your Bible? New sort of heading. No, no new heading. Verse 26 should not be a new paragraph. There's a subordinating conjunction, an explanatory conjunction of why we need to hold fast the confession, stimulate one another to love and good deeds, and not forsake the assembly. Why? Because you are your brother's keeper. Look at verse 26. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which consumes the adversaries. Go to church because apostasy. That's the argument. Be connected to one another in the vitality of real Christian experience because falling away. And so the gathering together of God's people regularly, speaking truth to one another, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another, confessing our sins to one another, all of those one another commands, they are critical to your life connected to Jesus Christ. This is God's means of grace to keep us from slippage. What are the dangers of hard heartedness? We're over time. We'll end there. Let's pray. You can get the notes. There are dangers. Dear Lord, thank you so much for these reminders. Your reminders of power to keep all whom you have saved. Again, God, if we were left to ourselves, our own devices, our own power, 
we would have been lost time and again. But you will not let anyone snatch your sheep out of your hands. You laid down your life for them. You promised to raise them up on the last day. Your father gave all your sheep to you. You purchased them with your own blood. Your Holy Spirit has sealed them to the day of redemption. God, we thank you that this work of salvation is yours through and through. And we would never boast except to boast in you. And we pray again that we would be humbled by the doctrines of grace, that we would be ambassadors of the doctrines of grace, that we would never tire of telling people about a great Savior. In whose name we pray. Amen.